Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for Navigating the Marketplace, How Graduate Students Can Take Advantage of the Affordable Care Act. We're pleased to have Jackie Knight with us. Jackie is the Assistant Director of Healthy Carolina Initiatives at the University of South Carolina, and I'm Heather Brandt, Associate Dean for Professional Development in the Graduate School. And we're going to get started with the webinar now. I'm going to turn things over to Jackie. As a reminder, there are a few handouts posted for this webinar, and you can access those at your leisure. So let me turn things over to Jackie. All right, Jackie, take it away. Great. Thank you, Heather. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. I am very excited to join you. As Heather said, um, I am Assistant Director for Healthy Carolina Initiatives here at the University of South Carolina, which is our vision for creating a healthy campus environment here on campus for students, faculty, and staff. Within my role, one of my um, tasks is to co-chair our Campus' Health Literacy Task Force, which I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today. For those who have not heard the term health literacy before, this is a definition provided by Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Health literacy is having the capacity to obtain, communicate, process, and understand basic health information and services needed to make appropriate health decisions. Now, when we talk about health literacy, there's really kind of three elements that we're referring to. We talk about preventative care, understanding federal guidelines and recommendations for fruit and vegetable consumption, physical activity to take care of your health on the preventive side, medical care, and that is seeking health services once you've gotten into a place where you need additional services from a medical provider, and that third element is health insurance, which is what we're going to talk more about today, and that's how you pay for those medical care services when you need them. Healthcare in the United States can be very confusing for some. So we have a video here which kind of briefly covers our healthcare and health insurance in the United States. comes out of your own pocket before your 
insurance starts paying. Depending on your plan, you might have a deductible for all your care, or it might only apply to some types of care, like hospital stays and prescriptions. So read your plan material, because it can add up to thousands of dollars. Another important part of your plan is the out-of-pocket maximum. This is the most you'll ever have to pay in any one year, at least for the benefits your plan covers. Your insurer will pay 100% of anything beyond the maximum for the rest of the year. It can be just as confusing dealing with prescriptions. Your plan has a list of drugs and will pay for, called a formulary, but the prices vary. Check with your doctor or pharmacist because a generic drug might fix you up the same as a brand name drug, but the price difference could be huge. So those are the costs typically involved. But remember that they'll be affected by your insurance plan's provider network. This is a list of doctors and hospitals that are connected to your plan. Insurance companies negotiate discounts with these providers. Stay in network and the discounts get passed to you. Go out of network and you can end up paying full price. And remember that out of pocket limit? It won't work if you go out of network. In some plans like HMOs or EPOs, your insurance would pay nothing if you go out of network. In other plans like PPOs, your insurance will cover you no matter where you go. You'll pay a lot more if you go out of network. Also, if you want to visit a specialist like an orthopedist, some plans require a referral from your primary care doctor. Sound easy enough? Well, sometimes staying in network can be tricky. In a hospital, it's possible that your surgeon can be in network while your anesthesiologist is not. If this happens to you, don't be afraid to negotiate with your provider or file an appeal with your insurer. So as you can see, there's a lot to think about when you choose an insurance plan each year. Some plans may have low premiums, but fewer doctors or hospitals and high deductibles. There are trade-offs, and understanding and choosing among plans isn't always easy. Remember, if you have questions, call your health plan and ask, or check with your hospital or doctor. If you still have questions, your state insurance department or consumer assistance program can help. With the Affordable Care Act, there's new support for consumers, so take advantage of it. Having health insurance protection is a good thing, especially when you know how it works. We hope you're now better prepared for the next time you have to pull that insurance card out of your wallet. Stay safe, America. All right, great. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. We like to think why recreate something that's so great, and that video just has such a great overview of health care and health insurance in the United States. A couple key terms I want to highlight from the video going, for going forward is premium. A premium is the monthly rate that you will pay for having health insurance to go to your provider. Deductible. This is the out-of-pocket cost you will pay before the plan kicks in. Copay and coinsurance is the amount that you would pay for services after you've reached that deductible. Typically, your health care insurance will kick in and pay a portion of health care costs, and you will pay a, the other half of it, either copay or coinsurance. Copay is a flat rate that you would pay for a visit, and coinsurance is dependent on a percentage for that particular service. And finally, the provider network. Understanding the difference between in-network and out-of-network is vital for navigating health care in the United States. Choosing a health care provider that is out of your network for your health care insurance plan will lead you to pay a higher out-of-pocket cost, which we, of course, for graduate students, want you to be able to make smart decisions about your health care. Just some basics about the health care and insurance. Every American has a right to health care coverage in the United States. Certain health care plans cost more than others, depending on the coverage. When you're looking for a plan, find one that meets your current health needs. As you can see in this video, it's very specific to the individual. Keep in mind that your health insurance will change depending on the health demands and who you share that plan with, if you happen to have any dependents or a spouse. 
And when you're looking at an plan, look at health centers that are considered in-network versus out-of-network. Be sure to consider if you're in the Columbia area and you're already seeing a physician to find a health insurance plan which has that physician as in-network so you have a lower cost to see them. Now at the end of that video, they also mentioned the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act, from a public health perspective, has been phenomenal for increasing access to health care for citizens in the United States. Again, we have a video to basically cover the principles of the Affordable Care Act for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, and we'll go ahead and play that for you now. If at any time you need to refer to the videos later, we do include a URL for each of the videos in the bottom right hand of your slides if you need to look at them at a later time. Obamacare means you get a host of new benefits and protections. For example, insurance companies are now required to cover women's wellness visits, mammograms, birth control for women, immunizations for kids, all without charging you a penny more. That means no extra co-pays or fees. Young adults can now stay on a parent's plan until they turn 26. Insurance companies can't limit the amount of care they'll cover over your lifetime. Also, if your insurance company spends more than 20% of your premium dollars on overhead, stuff like CEO salaries, marketing, administrative costs, they have to send you a refund for the difference. In January, that list of benefits gets even longer. It will be illegal to charge you higher premiums or refuse coverage because you get sick or have been in the past. Charging women more than men for the exact same coverage, also illegal. No more deciphering page after page of jargony paperwork from your insurance company to determine what they will or won't cover. Instead, you'll get a short, plain language summary of your benefits and coverage. Easy, right? You can learn more at healthcare.gov. Okay, what about the post down health insurance or people who buy coverage on their own? Here's what Obamacare has for you. A new, simple way to buy affordable, high-quality health insurance. Starting October 1st, go to healthcare.gov and use the new health insurance marketplace to see all of the health plans available in your area and sign up for the one that fits your needs and your budget. You can also find out if you're eligible to pay less for private health insurance or whether you qualify for other free or low-cost programs. All the plans in the marketplace are required to cover a core set of essential health benefits. Doctor's visits, emergency care, prescriptions and lab tests, rehab for illness or injury, mental health services, they all come standard. Plus, all those benefits and protections available to people who already have insurance, no-cost preventive care, coverage for pre-existing conditions, accountability for insurance companies, you get all of that, too. You can apply for marketplace coverage four ways. Online at healthcare.gov, by mail, on the phone, or in person. And open enrollment starts October 1st. You can learn more right now by visiting healthcare.gov or calling 1-800-318-2596. So here's the bottom line. Whether you need health coverage or you have it already, the Affordable Care Act offers new rights and protections that make coverage fairer and easier to understand. Excellent. So I hope for those of you who had questions about the Affordable Care Act that this video helped answer some of your questions. A couple key points I really want to make for this population in particular, graduate students, the benefits of Affordable Care Act include individuals 26 years old or younger are able to stay on family insurance plans under the Affordable Care Act. In addition, those covered by the Affordable Care Act receive the following benefits. Women's wellness visits are now covered, and that also includes birth control. Insurance will not limit the care provided to you over a lifetime, and women and men are now charged the same amount for the same type of coverage. Now, as many of you know, we have a new president-elect here in the United States, which means we could see some changes to the Affordable Care Act in the coming years. Fortunately, Dr. Heather Brandt had some pending updates that could potentially happen here, and she's able to share them with us. 
All right, thanks, Jackie. I'm going to take a few minutes here to let you know uh, what we think may happen to the Affordable Care Act. So initially, our simple answer to the question, what's going to happen to the Affordable Care Act, is no one knows. However, we can take a look at recent legislative action and proposals that have come out of the Senate and the House to give us an idea of what might happen in the future. So again, none of this information is a sure thing, but there is a lot of uncertainty and questions right now about the Affordable Care Act and whether or not this is still a viable option. It absolutely is, and it's an option for graduate students. What's going to happen in the future, we don't know, but enrollment is open right now. You can certainly take a look at the plans and enroll in the program and be assured you will have coverage for at least the next year. So one of the sources uh, that I mentioned we can take a look at includes the Senate's 2015 Reconciliation Bill. And if you would like to read this bill in its entirety, the URL is posted on the bottom of the slide. So every time there is legislation that is contentious in some regard, the Senate puts forth a reconciliation bill. And this is a reconciliation for the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. And in this reconciliation, the Senate makes recommendations for what can or should be done to correct or modify existing legislation. So for example, for the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, commonly referred to as Obamacare, uh, they are proposing that there are an, is an elimination of penalties for mandates. So in other words, the, the amount of money that's paid each year if you cannot prove that you have coverage or you have not signed up for coverage, uh, that those would be eliminated that premium tax credits, cost sharing, Medicaid expansion, and small business tax cre credits would be ended under the Senate's reconciliation bill. That's something that's concerning because we do know that through Medicaid expansion, the most vulnerable among us, especially the medically underserved, those who have limited financial resources, have been allowed to sign up for this public health benefit of Medicaid. You will note that the reconciliation bill does focus on preserving protection of pre-existing conditions. That is something that is largely viewed as being very favorable. It's one of the most commonly touted benefits of the Affordable Care Act. No matter what your political affiliation or beliefs, that that is an important step in the right direction. As a public health person, of course, I'm very concerned that for about the recommendation to eliminate the Prevention and Public Health Fund. The Prevention and Public Health Fund is an important component of addressing primary prevention, so supporting healthy eating, active living, participating in regular preventive vaccines and screening, understanding the role of communities in the environment. Those are some of the ways that this work is funded uh, through the Prevention and Public Health Fund. The Senate's reconciliation bill also prohibited federal funding for one year to entities that provided abortions. And this is uh, somewhat concerning on a public health basis because many of these same clinics are frontline providers to uh, men and women, including children, for their care. And so we would hate to see any restrictions or limitations on health care access. A favorable outcome is increased funding for community health centers. Community health centers are truly the frontline providers and safety net providers in many communities. And for those of you unfamiliar with the community health center model in South Carolina, we have a large number of community health centers that are critical to providing care to people across our state, to our neighbors. And lastly, uh, repealing a portion of Medicaid funding for U.S. territories, also viewed as, as being um, negative because people in these U.S. territories who met eligibility guidelines were able to enroll in that public health benefit. Another le uh, piece of legislative action, or in this case a plan or a proposed policy platform, 
is the houses a better way plan and this originates with speaker Paul Ryan and if you're interested in reading more about speaker Ryan's a better way plan the URL is in the lower corner of the slide so in a better way there's again no mention of full repeal of the Affordable Care Act which I also want to point out was not included in the Senate's 2015 reconciliation bill there's no mention or indication of full repeal in these legislative documents and the better way plan would uh, maintain uh, the focus on not using pre-existing conditions as a way to exclude people it would ban rescissions uh, cover dependents up to age 26 guarantee renewability and prohibit lifetime limits these are all viewed as, again, excellent benefits of the Affordable Care Act. New policies would include the allowance of the sale of health insurance across state lines. This creates a number of challenges for private insurers, and so it's, it's unknown if this is feasible to even achieve, but they're thinking about expanding the market for health insurance and doing that across state lines. Uh, state funding for high-risk pools would be included. So this is in states where we don't see Medicaid expansion. This has the potential to increase the burden on a state level without additional federal funds to help support that or offset those costs. Uh, funding state-level efforts to reduce premiums rather than allowing the federal government to determine those um, reductions in health insurance premiums using tax credits to purchase insurance that would be a new policy and the age race ratio would be adjusted so the age ratio is uh, it simply means that the youngest person in the pool determines how much the oldest person in the pool can, play, can pay. So the current age ratio is three to one. So that means the oldest person who's insured through a given plan can pay no more than three times what the youngest person pays. And there's a move to expand that to five to one. And the rationale for that is that older folks use more services. People use a lot of services uh, very early in their life and tend to use more services as they get older. And then continuous coverage protections, which would ensure that um, there was continuity in coverage and for types of coverage. So again, that's also viewed as being something that is uh, somewhat favorable as a new policy for the Affordable Care Act. So those are a few updates. Uh, again, the simple uh, responses. We don't really know what's going to happen to the Affordable Care Act, but as of today, it's in place and we anticipate it being in place through at least the next calendar year. It may change, it may look different, but there's no indication that a full repeal will, uh, will happen. 22 million Americans now have access to health insurance thanks to the Affordable Care Act, and that's a large number of people who would suddenly no longer have coverage and care. So important to keep that in mind as we're listening to Jackie, and I'm going to turn things back over to her to share with us some information about private insurance. Jackie? Sure. Thank you, Heather. So as you can hear, again, we don't know the answer for the certain changes for our Affordable Care Act, but what we can do is we can continue to improve our health literacy to be informed consumers of health care in the United States. So when we talk about graduate students and what your options are for health insurance coverage, first off, let's talk about private insurance. And the reason I bring this one up first is because as a graduate student, you had to either fill out a hard waiver form to waive out of the university's student health plan when you were admitted and registered for classes, or you decided to stay on our university-affiliated health plan. That is one of our private insurance options. And the reason we have that is so that you're protected and to ensure that you do have health insurance in case something were to happen. If you decided to not stay on the student health insurance plan once you looked at what your monthly premium was, there's several other private insurers that you could look at for their plans. These include Blue Cross Blue Shield, Humana, Aflac, and Geico. 
all of which provide multiple plans, and you can go look at their websites to see what their offerings are. There also is, of course, the open enrollment. And as Heather mentioned, we are currently in the open enrollment period right now. If you go to the web URL shared here on the slide, you can look at the prices for the 2017 plans. There's also useful tools on this website to determine based on your individual health needs which, what your premium cost could be and what are the different plans available to you. On here, you can also see if you qualify for a special enrollment in period for Medicaid or child health insurance programs. There's also special life events which may qualify you for special enrollment period. A couple examples include marriage, changes in a household, such as having a child, or moving locations. Please check out the website to see what other life circumstances consider you for a special enrollment period. And be sure that whether it's private insurance or if it's through the open marketplace, that you choose the plan that's best for you personally. So I talk about choosing the best plan for you. And again, this is so individualized. I have a video here which will help you kind of direct that initiative when you're trying to choose the right plan for you. So we'll watch that next. So now we've heard a little bit about how to choose the best plan for you. 
On this slide, I've recapped some of the questions presented in this video. The first one, do you want basic or comprehensive health care coverage based on your current health needs? The best way that I put this personally is, what level of financial risk are you willing to take for your health? Are you willing to do a comprehensive plan where you pay a higher monthly premium, therefore you have a lower deductible that you would pay out of pocket if something were to happen? That might be your best option if you have a chronic condition or if you need to see a provider regularly. Or does it make sense for you to have a savings plan if you're in good health and you think that you won't have to go to the uh, provider very often? Again, it's very personalized and kind of dependent on what level of risk you're willing to take and what you will pay out of your pocket when you do have to go to a provider in case there's an emergency that takes place. Our next question is how much should you spend? Again, this is personal about how much are you willing to spend monthly or if you have an emergency and have to pay it all the way up to your deductible cost. Who all will be on the health care plan with you? Do you have a partner, a spouse? Are there children in your household? These are questions to consider when you're looking at a plan. Is your provider part of the plan? If you currently have a provider, you want to check with them to see if they accept the insurance coverage plan that you're looking at. Additionally, if you're looking at a plan you don't already have a provider, be sure that you select providers that are within your insurance's network, again, to lower the, your cost for healthcare. Do you want easy access to a specialist? Again, making sure that you have the proper coverage for that if it's something that you desire. And do you have any other specific health care needs, such as medication? Many plans will cover a portion of medication. Sometimes they won't cover as much as others. Again, it's very different from plan to plan, so you need to be sure that you're looking at the details. I recommend using these questions as tools to navigate when you're looking into the health care plans for what is right for you. And next we'll talk about budgeting for health care. You know, as graduate students, I recall from when I was in school trying to cut my expenses here and there wherever I could. And I will say, as a staff and a professional now, healthcare is really one area where you don't want to sacrifice expenses. You want to stay well so you can be in the classroom and excel and improve your employability, your research, whatever it is that you want to excel in. You've got to take care of your health. So what we'll do is we'll watch a brief video now about how to budget for your health care and start to answer some of those questions that may be helpful for you to choose a health insurance plan. Just add up your regular health care 
expenses and figure out how much you'll need to save in one of these accounts so you don't end up in the red like Gary was at the beginning of this video. To sum it up, with the help of a solid health care budget and an HSA, Gary and his family are back in black. So now you know. Until next time, stay smart and stay healthy. All right, so I hope you've learned a lot from Gary today between the last two videos. Um, looking at tips for budgeting healthcare, as you saw in this video, it's so important to consider the monthly premium as well as annual cost, which includes the cost of prescriptions as well. Um, again, I can't iterate enough that this is so individualized from person to person, and um, it really is just based on your needs and what um sorry, go next slide. <laughs> it's really based on your individual needs. Um considering prescriptions as well, pre monthly premiums, annual cost. Um a really big thing that I like to suggest to people when they're looking at health insurance plans is to make sure you secure funds for your full deductible so that if anything were to happen if you are in an accident, that you're able to cover all of those costs. One way to do that is to look into a health savings account, which was mentioned in the video. What happens with a health savings account is that you make payments into it regularly so that if something were to happen, you're able to withdraw from that health savings account instead of directly out of your pocket, which is a good option. And it makes those large health costs much more manageable instead of paying a large check. Consider additional insurances as well. Often dental and I are not included within your health care package, so consider those as well. And like I said in the video, those will often kind of stay consistent, but they may change from year to year. And finally, secure funds for any out-of-pocket costs or unexpected costs. Simply have money in savings. You cannot predict your health. You can't predict life. Things can happen and you need to have health care coverage so that you can stay well and be in class. Again, all the listed expenses are specific just to health care. Remember to secure funds for all aspects of health. That includes preventative health as well. If you choose to a gym membership, be sure to go ahead and budget that into your health care cost annually so that you're including it. So that is all that I have for you today for United States Health Insurance, Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, how to budget and choose a proper health insurance plan for you. Um, if you have any questions at all, please go to the Student Health Services website. We have a specific link under important information for understanding healthcare and how to access healthcare services. Also, you can call our health um, Student Health Services if you have any questions at all. Thank you so much, Jackie, for taking the time today to help us understand the Affordable Care Act and how to better navigate the marketplace. We hope this was a useful webinar for our graduate students. Uh, we initially recorded this uh, webinar on November 18th, but due to some technical difficulties, have re-recorded it today because we really wanted to make sure that we got the information out during the open enrollment period, which ends on January 31st, 2017. Please make sure to check out our upcoming graduate professional development programming through hashtag grad. Prof DEV. It's the end of the semester. The holidays are upon us. It's almost the end of 2016. We know this can be a really stressful time. So we hope you'll take advantage of our Professional Development Friday's postings today, which are on self-care, uh, giving yourself time to uh, take care of you during this busy season that's upon us. And you can check those out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, WordPress blog, and also on our YouTube channel. Our next webinar will be on January 10th, and it will be an information session on the Graduate Civic Scholars Program, which is a unique professional development opportunity for individuals who are interested in publicly engaged scholarship, uh, such as working with community partners or organizations for public good. So if that's something you're interested in, please make sure to check 
the graduate school calendar. And following that, we'll have another webinar on January 27th. This will be focused on academic publishing. It's going to be entitled The Paper Chase, a Teen Science Approach to Publishing. So if you have some data lying around or you have a paper that's almost finished but just needs a little bit of time and attention, or you work on a large team where there are lots of opportunities, maybe the paper chase is the right method for you. So thank you again for joining us today, and as always, we welcome your feedback on our professional development programming. And if you have questions, we know that our friends at Student Health Services, Jackie and others, will be glad to help you. So thank you, and have a great day.